Well, church family, it is good to be with you, my beloved family. Thank you for navigating around the construction. Thank you for your patience while we figure out how. Let's start with some good news, shall we? Today is our friend James Urban's birthday. When you see James, James, are you in the room? No, he's still serving. Politeness and kindness restricts me from saying how old James is. However, I will tell you he qualifies for Social Security. We praise the Lord for that. We are grateful for his participation and leadership with us. We are indebted to James and the leadership that he provides. So when you see him, make sure and wish him a very happy birthday. More good news. Our friend Johnny Rodriguez is standing in the back of the auditorium. Johnny, wave to everybody, would you? He's so happy to. Thursday night of this week, Johnny was named as the Crime Stopper Midland County Sheriff's Department Officer of the Year. We are proud of you, Johnny. We thank you. It was quite a celebration, friends. I'm sorry you missed it, if you did. Let's also talk about another celebration, this one, the one that you find in Revelation 21. You know, Way too often, when I use this passage, it's at a funeral. Someone has passed away. I'm speaking when I read it to the family that has survived and, or the friends that have gathered, and we're talking about what it will be like the next time we're with them. That is a wonderful, beautiful, and poignant portrait of what ought to happen at a funeral for a Christian. There's nothing wrong with that. But let me say today, I'm glad to use it at a service that isn't that. For it is not merely meant for funerals. For all of the confusion and all of the debate that we've talked about over the last year with misunderstanding and, and other interpretations of a lot of the passages that we've walked through, when we get down to Revelation 21, all of that falls away. Like things that just don't belong anymore, it just sort of collapses to one side or the other. And this passage stands supremely above it all. We all pretty much agree that when we arrive here, we find Eden restored and heaven and earth remade. This section that we are taking up today, it is the moment after all of the judgment has been rendered. Those that belong in the lake of fire have been placed there. Those that belong in the kingdom of heaven, they are there now. Let us rejoice then and begin our time with a moment of prayer. Won't you pray with me? We rejoice today, Jesus, in the silence of this moment that this is what waits for us. We might have had some questions about how all the other things play out, but Lord, we know this is where we're headed. So all that other is just window decoration. You've got a plan and you're moving us toward it. I pray today, Lord, for those who are hearing this, who are saying, I don't, I don't understand that plan, and maybe I'm not even a part of it yet. Let today be the day, Jesus, that you transform our lives and that we become like you even more. Let today be the day that those who are not in line with you, who are not calling you their Savior, let them call on you today. Lord Jesus, we thank you today that we can rest that this is where you're taking us. So in the hope that it provides, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4, speak of a new heaven and a new earth. Let me read it. My friend Ralph did such a fine job, but let me read it one more time. I, know, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth that passed away, and the sea was no more. Go back to Revelation 20, the passage that we used last week, and you'll see that section that we talked about, about the 
earth and the, the, the heavens fled. And we talked about last week how we're not quite sure what that means, but we know that it means that the created order has changed and that something has, has completely reordered it. Well, here, here, friends, is where it, it returns to us. The former order has passed. And if you're one who underlines, <clears throat> get this sea was no more part. Remember what we said a year ago now about where John was when he wrote this. Where was he? He was on the island of Patmos, surrounded by water, cut off from everybody and everything. <laughs> Not for long. When John sees the new heaven and the new earth, there is no sea. Now for us, we're like, how is that even possible? What does that even look like? How can that be? <laughs> Aren't you glad you don't have to figure it out? Because God already has. Out of the ashes of the created order, the new Eden rises. We don't know exactly how God will do that, but we know this. God will throw all of it into the lake of fire. This, friends, this new heaven and the new earth come to replace, not renovate, the existing one. What will this new reality look like? Well, there's been no shortage of attempts to replicate it. And even our friend the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 talks about it, talks about levels to heaven, and perhaps there's something to be said there. But John doesn't even attempt a full description. What we can be certain of is it's a lot different than what we have now. Perhaps this new reality meant that he was no longer cut off from the rest of the world, and perhaps this new reality means neither will we be. Imagine... Imagine that a fire ravages a house, destroys it, wipes it out. But from the ashes, something else rises in its place. That's the imagery that is being given to us here. And out of this moment, in this new heaven and new earth, verse 2, I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, God delivers the new Jerusalem, God's dwelling place. In God delivering this new Jerusalem, we presume that this marker of his presence comes with it. Let's go for a moment to the city of Jerusalem. The city wasn't always what we think of it now. No, when the people came across the, the, the Jordan River, when Joshua led them into the promised land, the city of Jerusalem was inhabited by the Jebusites, and they held on to it for quite some time. It wasn't until really King David's time that he moved his capital there, and then he put the temple, he designated a spot that we call Mount Moriah. And history tells us that's where our friend Abraham was ready to offer his son Isaac, almost like a full circle kind of moment. Now, now that plot of land, 34 acres in, 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 in square, is what we call Temple Mount. It's where Solomon's temple stood, and it is where the Dome of the Rock stands now. This is a key question for understanding this. Does that mean this new Jerusalem will inherently resemble or reflect the current one? Well, this is a, an important question and one we'll take up further tonight. In short, let us say no. God is not restricted to the floor plan of the existing Jerusalem to make a new one. More to the point, the new, sin, new Jerusalem is not paralleled to the old one, but rather to a bride beautifully prepared for her husband. Just a few weeks ago, I did a wedding, and it was a lot of fun. It was a beautiful and glorious time. Preston and Hallie were wonderfully prepared for the moment that God had given them. And the best part, as always, was the bride coming in. This service, though, went a little differently than we planned. What happened in this service is the disc jockey was supposed to play a particular song, and that was her cue to come. As we were getting ready for him to play that song, 
Something happened under the table. He unplugged his device. And so there was no music for about three minutes. If you've ever stood in front of people in complete silence for more than 30 seconds, you know how awkward that is. Uh, Even for those of us who do it all the time. I stood there praying, Lord, what should I do? Perhaps I should just start singing the wedding march myself. But then I got worried that I would, instead of singing the wedding march, I would sing Pomp and Circumstance instead. I thought that might throw a wet blanket over the wedding. You think so? So instead, I opted to stand there and glare condemningly at the disc jockey along with everybody else. The best part, though, was everybody got a longer look at how beautiful the bride was. That made it a lot easier to take. Hallie had prepared for a long time for that day. Can I tell you today, my friends, the bride was ready, even if everything else wasn't. I want to remind you of what God has to say about us. We are his bride. And I want to ask you a very important question. It's one that we'll follow up on at the end. Are you preparing for the groom? If you're not, then today is the day to start doing so. The most significant element of the current Jerusalem is the temple. The temple that was there and the temple that will be again. The temple that was there was Solomon's temple, and the one that followed it is the one we call Zerubbabel's temple. And the one that came behind that was Herod's temple, also called the second temple, although it's actually the third temple. The Herod's temple was the one that Jesus visited when he was here. And this temple, it was a marker of God's presence, a place where you could go and connect with God and talk to him. And this was the very place that he, it was estimated, dwelt, a place that he was where you could go and find him. I want you to notice this new Jerusalem. It'll be a little different than that. You won't have one place. It'll be the whole city. Get this, he will dwell with them, and they will dwell with him. These, God's peculiar people, the chosen generation, the ones that were chosen before the foundation of the world, those who belong to him, those who are pilgrims, but pilgrims no more, those who are indigenous citizens of this new Jerusalem, these are the ones who will be the inhabitants of the city, New Jerusalem. And friends, if that's you, then you can rejoice because these, these are the ones that will reside here forever, for all eternity. See it in verse three. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. Underline those last few words, would you? For the former things have passed away. All these things that burden us will go away. Imagine, if you will, what will be printed in the New Jerusalem newspaper if all the bad stuff goes away. Wouldn't be much to say, would there? Newspapers only print bad news for the most part. But I want you to see this because I want us to recognize where we're going is almost nothing like where we are. And for that, we can be grateful. There are some descriptors, though, to tell us about ourselves. Let's take a look at it. Three descriptors of the citizens of God's city. One, they are God's people. I want you to notice that they are not described by ethnicity, by demographic. They are not described as where they came from. They are simply described as God's people. Let's pause here for a moment and say, that's all of us. Those of us in Christ, regardless of denomination or affiliation, will stand together around the throne of God. And here's the the best part of all. All those differences that we draw so starkly between ourselves will fall away. 
the ones we erect and the ones that have been erected for us, they will all fall away. Well, Darren, wait a minute. Some of those people aren't like us. Yes, I know. They're quite different than us in a lot of different ways. And yet, when we arrive at the, at the throne of God in the new Jerusalem, we will simply be God's people. Now, I was always told if a man's from Texas, he'll tell you, don't, em don't embarrass him by asking him. Here's where that doesn't matter. Here's the second thing about it. They're content and at rest. No more crying, no more mourning, no more pain. And this last piece, they have overcome. The old order has gone, and a new order has come. This new order is brought about by the hand of Jesus himself. Move with me to the next section. Seated on the throne, Jesus proclaims all things new. See it in verse 5. And he was seated on the throne, said, Behold, I'm making all things new. He, the pronoun that is used there, it is a reflection on where he's been. And it links us back to the rest of the book that precedes it. He, when we see it here, it could be either God or Jesus, but in this context, it most certainly seems that Jesus is the more likely choice. Jesus, seated on the throne, said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Jesus declares an oath to stand firm upon all things are made new. It's as if Jesus has raised his right hand as if he needed to, to swear his oath. But that's what it means when Jesus says, Behold, he is making a promise on which we can build our lives. He's making a promise that guarantees our future, that settles the question once and for all. I want you to imagine for a moment all things being made new. I want you to imagine somebody that you know that's sick, that that sickness goes away. I want you to imagine the last loved one that you lost because they were sick and that sickness goes away. I want you to imagine the last time you had a problem and that problem goes away. Jesus declares an oath to stand firm upon all things are made new. Go ahead and put that up on the screen, Cindy. I want people to see this. All things are made new. You know, I spent a lot of time studying, preparing to come today, and I want you to notice those three words, all things new. It's an amazing thing. In Greek, it means everything. You might say, well, that's not very profound, Aaron. I know. Jesus didn't want it to be. He wanted it to be encompassing. So whatever you have that needs to be made new, Realize that Jesus promises it will be. Get this, including you. Mortality rate is still 100%. But in this moment, all of that will be washed away. Need you wait for this moment? Well, for the physical part of it, yes. But for the spiritual part, no. Go back with me to John chapter 3, the interview with Nicodemus, where Jesus meets with him and he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. The first birth was merely physical. The second birth is spiritual. The first death comes for everybody. The second one is a spiritual death. If you are born twice, then you'll only die once. But if you're only born once, you'll die twice. Friends, I want you to avoid that second death. Because this is the other thing that Jesus says at the end of verse 5. It is done. Conclusive statement. Write this down, Jesus said, for these words are trustworthy and true. Verse 6, he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 
this, this statement, a declaration that links himself with the God who met with Moses in Exodus 3 and 4. It is the God who guarantees the making of everything new. It is done. It's a single word that Jesus utters there in verse 6, gegonan. It's a perfect active meaning. It is a completed action that isn't quite fulfilled yet, but is still on its way. Most assuredly, it has future implications. We may not see it from where we are, but we can be sure it's coming. Our limited perspective is restricted by our physicality, but for the Alpha and the Omega, he sees it as finished. And then follow him in verse 6, and you'll hear him say, living water to the thirsty. To the thirsty I'll give from the spring of water of life without payment. A statement, a declaration that lines up with what Jesus said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. This proclamation that is for those who long for the water of life, they need not pay for it. The one who conquers, Jesus says in verse 7, will have this heritage, and I'll be his God, and he will be my son. It is an inheritance to the one who overcomes. And verse 8, punishment to the faithless. Let's take that second part first. It's curious as to why Jesus included this in the Apostle John's notes for chapter 21. It would have made much more sense to us if he had included it in chapter 20. After all, by the time we get to chapter 21, all of that is already done. It's put behind us, but I want to call your attention again to the double purpose of Revelation. One purpose, a word of encouragement to the faithful in Christ. Things will not always be as they are. The second purpose, a word of warning to those outside of Christ. Knowing that this would be read over and over and over again, oh friends, this is still a word of hope that it's not too late. Let us move back to the inheritance Suffering alone doesn't guarantee or qualify one for the kingdom. There have been many who've suffered needlessly, and there will be many more who will. But the conqueror Jesus speaks of here is the one who overcomes by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. Go back to Revelation 7, and you'll see that declaration list listed there. This perspective sustains us against the lukewarmness that the church of Laodicea struggled with. Compromise, the church of, of uh, another church struggled with in chapter 2. It pushes us away from infatuation with our limited existence and our selfish pursuits and instead leans into God's full faith and credit that we will be granted this inheritance Today, friends, I want to ask you a couple of things to take home. Take this with you and let it resonate in your heart. One, returning humanity to Eden was always God's plan. That's always what he meant to do. This revelation may have been given to John in about 95 AD, but it was born into the heart of God from the very beginning. When he pushed them out of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, he made a covering of the animal, he made a covering from the animal. Remember, a blood sacrifice, a covering to protect them, a covering for their nakedness, a covering to shelter them, a covering that would help them sustain themselves in the long desert between Genesis 3 and Revelation 21. I want to ask you today, that new covering was also a blood sacrifice. It was made on the cross of Jesus Christ. It's as if he took a robe and took it off of his own shoulders and put it on ours. And that covering is not ours to hold. It was a gift. It was granted to us. The fancy word is imputed. He gave it to us through his grace. He gave it to us because he chose to. He gave it because he loved us. He didn't, we didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it, but he gave it to us just the same because he always meant for us 
to find our way back to Eden. A lot of people, they've taken that robe of Christ on and, and in the waiting, in the struggle to get home, they've taken it off and, and shed it and thrown it aside or they've grown weary in their waiting and they've, they've declared that God is unfaithful and that if God hasn't done it yet, he's never going to. I want to tell you, friends, when our God declares it done, it is completed. Rest today in the fact that awaiting it will be worth the struggle. Finally, when God proclaims it done, I can trust his timing. So in Revelation 21, 6, it is declared done. Here we are, nearly 2,000 years later, after the completion of this book, and yet we are still waiting for this moment to come to us. Does that mean God is unfaithful or that we're in a hurry? I ask you to answer that question personally today. What about you? The rush that we have to get to Eden is usually self-fulfilling. I want what I want for my own comfort and prosperity. There's nothing wrong with that. God has made us with an insatiable desire for ourselves. And yet that's not what Jesus has called us to. If any man would come after me, he says, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow after me, so says Luke 9. I encourage you today, let that be the calling card for your life. You might say, well, I'm not a preacher, Darren. You don't have to be to follow Jesus. All you have to be is willing. How can I be sure? How can I be certain that I really can trust him? This is a question that I get rather often. There are some questions that we can't answer, but I think we can this one. What agency did we have in the sun rising this morning? None whatsoever, and yet God made it happen. What agency did you have in, in waking up this morning other than your alarm clock or perhaps someone in your family? You didn't have to wake up. God could have taken you home overnight, and yet he chose to. He gave you another day. And today, this day, is the one God has given you to do something with it. I'm asking you today, what are you going to do? You have two choices. Trust God's timing that it will come in his good time and rest in that or rush past it and try to hurry God's timing along. My prayer for you today, friends, is that you'll trust God's timing. You see, Jesus came for you. And this newness that he intends to bring, according to Revelation 21.5, starts here by giving your old life for his new one. If you've never invited Jesus into your, law, to be, into your life to be your Lord and Savior, here's what I want you to do. When we stand up and sing and just say, you come down and talk to me, I'll be waiting for you right down here. We need to talk about how we can move you from this word of warning to this word of encouragement. I don't want you in the last part of this in verse 8. I want you in verse 5. If you've already done that, but like, hey, you weren't baptized, then come talk to me about that. Baptism doesn't save you, but it reflects that you have been saved. Come down and let's talk about that if that's you. Maybe you need to be a part of a church family. Come down and let's talk about how you can be a part of that. Perhaps you need to come to this altar and talk to the Lord about a struggle you're having or something that's on your heart and mind. Maybe to come pray for somebody else. These steps are open for you. Let's pray together. Lord, I'm so grateful for the promise that you've made to make all things new. When I look around me, Lord, I see a lot of things that need to be made new. Things that are broken, things that are wrong, things that are out of place. 
You and I talk about it a lot, Lord. How will you ever make it all right? But that's my limited perspective, trying to figure out how I would fix it. Lord, thank you that you don't need my help. I pray, Lord, for somebody that may be struggling with that very same thing. That today would be the day they would surrender it to you. With hearts and hands uplifted, they would say, Jesus, I'm yours. I pray today, Father, for transformed lives in our building. For all those who are watching and for this moment for us. So do your work now, Lord Jesus, in each of our lives and let today be the day you do it. We ask your mercy over this time, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.